Alright, so we basically went all the, over the course rules last time, and now we will just introduce things a little further in terms of what are the, what are the topics going to be and why it is that you actually need to take this class. So just a quick overview of the course topics. We will go over linear algebra. Linear algebra is foundation of a lot of engineering methods. Okay? You're not taking so far a class that formally is just linear algebra. So here we are overviewing for, for that reason. You will probably find an overview in your differential equations class because they are tied together quite a bit. But linear algebra is at the bottom of a lot of things. Let me show, uh, give you an example. So linear algebra, we will go through like matrices and matrix vector calculations and multiplications. So just one everyday place where you're actually using linear algebra is when you click on italics in your, let's say that you're typing something up in your text editor, okay? And you want your letter to either be bold or italics. The calculation that is taking an image of your letter from this to shear okay, is a matrix vector multiplication for the vector is the position of the every point in that letter, and there's shear matrix that you multiply that letter with. So every time you click on that button, there's actually some matrix vector multiplication underneath that calculates, oh, where is this letter now? Okay, and then it's displayed on your is that simple. Not to mention when you actually fly, okay, the computer, uh, the computer in the cockpit is going through numerous calculations that involve really large matrices, as in million, uh, uh, and actually solving linear systems that have million unknowns on constant basis. Okay, so that's something that is always underneath. You kind of often don't even know about it, and you will learn the basics of it because it is an engineer. There's so many applications that you need to know. Now, we will actually do some things by hand, so you learn how things work by hand, so you know how, what, what it is that you need to do. But for anything practical, you actually do need the help of computers. And this is where the second part of the class is coming through. We will learn MATLAB, that's just, going, that's just an environment of choice that is going to ease our programming blues in this semester, so we will just go through like basics and how to program, how to look for errors and so forth, and root finding and all, this is actually the numerical methods that we're going to learn and that, you, that are basically helpful for you to study. This is just really, this class is just scratching the surface, there's so much to numerical methods, for instance, how to solve PDEs or how to solve partial PDEs or partial differential equations and so forth. For that, we don't have time in this semester, so this is just an introductory class. We will do root finding, finding zeros of an equation, uh, systems of linear equations, nonlinear equations, how to fit the curve, a little bit about interpolation and then integration. I hope to get to ordinary differential equations, but this one is always depending on the time at the end of the semester. So again, we will actually learn how to compute the solutions to these problems using a computer. Now, course materials will be, as I mentioned already, they will be posted on the website. The textbook that I somewhat, I follow some chapters, some of them uh, are actually expanded, is this chapter, Applied Numerical Methods with MATLAB. You're not required to buy it. You should know by now whether you actually prefer to read the book when you're studying. If you do, then get a book. Otherwise, whatever I post online should be enough for you to master the material. And there is this alternative textbook as well by Rechtenwald, uh, also numerical methods with math. Again, you're not required to purchase. And you are very welcome to come to my office and or stay here after the class a little to check this book out just to see whether you're interested. Okay. Now, we will actually... MATLAB you can install for free. That has happened actually last year. We got a site license at this campus, so you can actually install it on your computer for your use. And you just follow instructions on the, this website, and you have to register with a UTexas address because otherwise they don't know that you're coming from the University of Texas. 
We will use some Microsoft Excel, but mostly we will hang out with MATLAB. And for tests, you will be allowed to bring a calculator, but it has to be a very basic calculator, not your phone. Your phone has a basic calculator, but it has all these communication capabilities that we don't like during tests, okay? So don't leave your home at home, uh, phone at home, even though, quite frankly, I don't carry a calculator around as much since I've had my smartphone. <laughs> and it can actually do all of the calculations I need. Okay? So you will need a very basic calculator for that. Now, there were already some questions in installation details. So if you start uh, installing MATLAB, then it's going to ask you to which toolboxes on top of MATLAB you, you, you would actually like. Technically, we can get away with just the basic MATLAB. I will suggest, so uh, given my research background, more likely than not, you will get some images to look at and visualize as your plotting assignment later on when we actually learn visualization in MATLAB. So I'd say that it's safe to say that image processing toolbox will be helpful for that task, just in case. Doesn't have to be, but just in case. So I would here add image processing toolbox. Um, a lot of them are advanced toolboxes. I will just single out a couple of them just in case you are interested in something that you might want to do. If you want extra data analysis, statistics toolbox is helpful for maybe possibly a different class. Okay. Symbolic math can actually help you with calculus. You can figure out symbolic, how to reduce and how to actually symbolically compute without actually computing a result, but without the result of an equation. So this might be helpful with your calculus class. Okay. And uh, another one, well, Simulink is mostly for electrical engineers because they uh, process a lot of um, a lot of images, and this is a lot of signals. And this is this MATLAB coder and compiler. If you think, so this is maybe for later. If you think, oh, I like this programming thing, but MATLAB is a little too slow, I need to speed it up, then you will need this coder and compiler to actually translate your code to a compiled language and speed it up. So this might mean nothing to you now. It's OK. It's probably flying over. And you're like, what is she talking about? So just put it in the back of your mind that you might want this coder and compiler to speed up later on if that becomes an issue. If not, you're just good with my classes. If you have plenty of memory on your computer, just install it all and don't think about it. <laughs> so those are your options, OK? Pretty much either way we go, it's good. I would think. I'm still designing the project, but basically, image processing toolbox might be helpful. All right? And I'm just going to briefly <coughs> type that in just so that we actually have it. Actually, before I go in and explain it, so what is the difference between science and engineering? <clears throat> so scientists, in general, will look for something in detail and isolate the mechanism and try to study it, okay? and just go down deeper into very basic, very, very, very much fundamental things, how things work. Engineer, we essentially take that and say, okay, my life is a little more co complicated than this isolated world. Okay, I'm a petroleum engineer. I cannot, 
isolate my reservoir. It's down there. It's far away from me. I can't do anything. But I'm going to figure things out anyway. Okay? So there is a lot of trial and error. You try to understand the fundamentals as much as you can. And when you do, it really moves you far along. But in the meantime, you are doing things anyway. Okay? So in petroleum engineering, if you remember, those the first images from Texas and Pennsylvania, they would poke the ground and suddenly there's this geyser of oil. Well, that's bad engineering. That doesn't happen anymore, okay? So that's a sign of really bad engineering. Now we have all of these BOPs on top of the well, and some of them are sitting in front of the building, right? Those colorful things are basically structures that are preventing that from happening. So over 100 years, we've obviously came a long way in figuring out how things work, right? And how it, we didn't always know the big fundamental mechanisms, right? But you, for trial and error, you figure how to fix things, fix things and move on. So basically, they play off each other, science and engineering, and they need each other. So this is essentially what I said. Like, you actually try to isolate a single element of nature and understand it really well. And engineers design and build things that work having that fundamental uh, knowledge in mind, but they work with the complicated uh, circumstances nevertheless. So if you know the laws, it's really good. And one place where this fundamentals really help is that you have a complicated system. One basic question that an engineer has to ask is, how do I simplify it? What are the key things that I need to know? Okay. So if I'm asking first time, so I'm flooding a reservoir, and I'm wondering what is the first time of arrival of my flood 100 meters away, okay? is advection of the fluid flowing moving by basically a difference of pressure, or diffusion more important? Do you know what diffusion is? So diffusion happens when I have chemical gradient, okay, in concentration, and Advection happens when I have a gradient of pressure. Which one is more dominant? Pressure, in this case. For permeable rock, anyway. For shale, it might not be. Okay. So I have to know how do I simplify and what is my dominant mechanism that I'm actually... So, yes, I could actually... So I'm busy here designing numerical methods, and I could spend my entire semester designing work for diffusion, but it doesn't help me in this particular so you have to be practical. Okay, it's beautiful to have a wonderful method that solves everything that you want to know about diffusion, but that's not what your main problem is. And as an engineer, you have to do that first gauge. Okay, what is the first thing that I have to worry about here? Then I first, as a first order method or first order solution, I'm going to tackle that one and add everything else as I go along. Okay, so that's an important skill to have as an engineer. And then petroleum engineers, uh, well, we, we brag about it, but essentially we deal with one of the most complicated systems out there, and often I don't have my reservoir in front of me, so I can't, can't fix it. If car breaks down, well, at least I can, you know, open the hood and take it apart and figure out, and I can actually isolate. In, in, well, in most recent cars, it's not so easy to isolate, but never mind. <laughs> in early cars, you could isolate different parts of the car and figure out what was wrong, and then fix it up. We don't necessarily have, so we have to typically look at the responses in pressure, or any kind of pressure is the most common measurement, but basically by the response in pressure, I have to figure out what's happening in my reservoir, give or take. Okay. So that's, uh, that, those are complicated situations. Of course, there's a lot of scenarios that could take place. Okay. So computation in itself, in helping us to do that, okay, I have theory, experiments, and computation. And computation in itself is sort of one of the latest legs, you could say, in science, because it required computers to actually develop. I will actually give you today a reading assignment that will just go over how kind of computers and how the initial computer was, uh, initial computer was a mechanical machine, machine. And there's a cool TED talk, do you all Ever watch TED Talks? They're kind of cool. I like their, they're my 15 minute breaks browsing on TED and learning something, uh, something new. So I will actually give you, uh, not a reading, but a video assignment. 
on that and one more also on how MATLAB as a program came to be. And you will just have a couple of questions to answer or to look for in those, uh, in those two. But I will also let Dr. Odin, actually I will assign this one for you to watch as well. So this is Dr. Odin from Institute for Computational and Engineering uh, computational engineering and sciences here in Austin. He's a very famous person, and he will. I will post this one as a viewing assignment as well, uh, so you can uh, learn about computation and why is it important. And there's this <laughs> numerous jokes that go on that uh, in, in terms of how different groups of people uh, solve problems. Okay? And this kind of also highlights the computation and certain importance part of it. So I've uh, modified this joke to be about three women on purpose. Uh, three women, a physicist, an engineer, and a computer scientist, are traveling in a car, and suddenly the car starts to smoke and stops. And they try to solve a problem. This problem, so now we have three different approaches. Physicist says, this is obviously a classic problem of torque. It has been overloaded beyond the elasticity limit of the main axis. Well, that's helpful. <laughs> but engineering says, let's be serious. The matter is that it has burned the spark of the connecting rod to the dynamo of the radiator, and I can easily repair it by some hammering. Computer scientist says, well, if we get off the car, wait a minute, and let's just get in and try again. Well, this is a joke, all right. <laughs> But there is something crucial about computation in it. It can be repeated. So you write something or write some solution to or write your program, and then you can execute again, execute again, execute again. Okay? So you put in the work, and then it kind of what's called scales up. You can do it multiple times over, and you can just let the computer run, go have your coffee, and come back to a solution. Okay? So there is, uh, there is some benefit to this repeatability in computation. So basically we have, again, three tools. Some of it is theory. Here's Albert Einstein as the famous face of the theory. Some of it is designing experiments that are controlled and in the lab. So I control the inputs and outputs and figure out how the system responds. I still might not know always the fundamental uh, mechanisms that are happening, and especially if I'm doing things in a this big piece of rock, okay? Unless I have x ray vision, I don't see inside. So all I see is some sort of outside response in that rock or outside measurement. So for that, for seeing inside, I might actually want to do some computation. So those people who tell you that theory is everything or just experiments are the only thing true or only computation is true, all of them are wrong. We need all three things okay. so, so actually, they typically work on different scales and different in different domains. So we do need three old thing, three things, and we will kind of introduce this computation part in this course. So, how do I actually go by solving? I typically design a problem. So, let's say in differential equations, or some, is anybody taking transport phenomena? Okay, a couple of you. So, in transport phenomena. For those of you who have taken it or are planning to take it, you will learn how to solve the flow, typically in a tube that's a basic starting problem. And you will hate that plus because there will be a long, some of you will hate that plus. I love it. I teach it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I teach the graduate uh, So basically, you will spend like three pages solving by hand a differential equation to figure out what the flow in the tube is. And then you will do another three pages to do the same thing for analysts. And then you will take some complicated shape and get very frustrated because no, you cannot spend any number of pages to solve that one. It's not solvable by hand. Okay? So this is where you need to design a numerical method to solve Navier-Stokes. It's a partial differential equation that is, describes the flow. Okay? So you basically need to design a method that will solve that equation so you can actually get where, what is your pressure and what's its response. There's this very complicated, nonlinear, difficult relationship between velocity and pressure for fluids. Okay? And that's described by the years now. So basically, that's where I need numerical methods. Now, 
theory, you still have to put them there and you're like, why do I need transport phenomena class, right? Or why do I need, why don't I just do computation? I need to verify. So that solution that I'm solving by hand, will, I will use that solution to verify my computation in a very simple problem of the tube. And when I verify it on a couple of problems that I know the solution to, and I see, oh, it's working well, after that, I trust it. Okay. For the complicated shape, I don't know unless I have an experiment. Okay. So I don't know whether it's working well, but I'm going to trust it because I verified it on something that I know that it's working. So do you see the interplay of theory, computation? So they don't work in isolation, they work together. Okay. So these numerical methods are they're approximate solutions, they're never the precise analytical solution. I don't plug in something into a functional form and get a result out. I typically have to work on it a little and then I get the result out. And this method that allows me to do that is called numerical method. Now, actually, let's actually come up with the method and implement it. Let's say that I want to, this is also going to point how parallel computing works, just for a very brief moment. So we're actually going to find an algorithm to find who was born in this class furthest from Austin. Okay? Furthest away. We might need help of Google Maps, but we'll do it anyway. So one solution is that everybody yells their yells their so, uh, place of birth. It's not a very practical one. You could also write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me, and then I would spend one hour sorting through all of this. I would do sort and figure out, but I'm not going to do that. I'm a computational scientist. I know that. So I'm actually going to implement it right now. So we're going to divide and conquer. We're going to start from this side, and you will tell, so the first person in a row, whoever is the first person in a row, will tell their place of birth. Okay. And typically it should be a city and a country so we don't run into, Texas is large, so we don't want to run into right, who is further, who is not. And you might need the help of Google Maps to help out. So you will tell your place of birth to him. He's going to compute and say, aha, is that further from Austin or not? And between his place of birth and her place of birth, he's going to decide which one is further and pass that one along. Then she will do again computation and say, okay, is this place of birth that I just heard further than mine? And if it is, pass that one along. If not, then she'll pass hers along. Is that clear? So we're going to do a maximum computation right here at each, at each computational node. And pass all the way down, okay? And those people at the end keep the place in memory and then we'll go down, and the person from the top will start the same process, and at the end, he's gonna know the furthest place from us. Clear? Let's try. All right, start. Whoa. <laughs> you might be from maps, or just make a decision right now. Be an engineer, make a decision without the knowing. Whatever <laughs> it is. I'm <laughs> 
Are we Thank you.